Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this event, especially on such a beautiful afternoon. Um, this event is organized by the Oxford Martin Program on Human Rights for Future Generations. I am Professor Dapwa Kande. I'm one of the co-directors of that program, together with Professor Sandy Fredman and Professor Simon Caney. I will say just a word about the program, and then I will say a word about the moderator for the debate, and then I will hand over to, to the moderator. The Oxford Martin Program on Human Rights for Future Generations is a program uh, funded by this school, the Oxford Martin School. It's an interdisciplinary program that includes law, philosophy, politics and international relations, and the central uh, research question that the program is examining is the extent to which human rights provides a, a fitting framework for addressing some of the world's biggest challenges. And in particular, we are looking at the relationship between human rights and poverty, human rights and protection of the environment, particularly climate change, and finally, human rights and an armed conflict. So it is not only interdisciplinary, but it is also one which is looking at a number of, of um, interlocking challenges. Interlocking because these are challenges that cause one another and that are caused by one another. This event is um, organized in the format of, of a debate. And as I'm sure you know, our uh, question is whether a world court for human rights should be established. We have two speakers who will address that. The moderator is Professor Harold Koh, and I will introduce him, and then he will introduce the speakers. Professor Harold Koh, I'm sure, is very well known to all of you. He is a Sterling Professor of International Law at Yale Law School, and he was previously Dean of Yale Law School. He is a renowned academic in public international law, human rights law, constitutional law. But in addition to that, he has also served in the US government in various capacities. His latest um, work in government was as legal advisor to the US State Department um, in the first term of the Obama administration. And previously, he had served as assistant secretary uh, of state for labor, democracy, and, and human rights. Harold is no stranger to Oxford. He was a student here some years ago, shall we say, <laughs> when he was uh, a Marshall Scholar. He has also returned regularly as a visiting fellow at several colleges, All Souls. He's an honorary fellow at, at Maudlin. And I think most recently, he was the uh, Oliver Smythe's lecturer at, at Balliol College. So thank you very much, Harold, for agreeing to moderate this debate. And I will hand over to you. Forgotten. I should say a couple of things which I was instructed to say, but I forgot. First of all, this event is being uh, webcast, um, and so you should just be, be aware of that. I suppose what that means is that if you ask a question, you will be, you will be shown. Um, and then the other thing that I would request is that if you could just uh, switch off your mobile phones or turn them on to silent, that would be, that'd be useful. Thank you. Well, um, I'm prepared for my ministerial role here by watching the last 28 presidential debates. <laughs> so let me start by saying, no insults. <laughs> um, this will be a polite uh, British-style debate of the Oxford form. Um, the resolution, uh, as it is uh, precisely worded, is resolved a world court for human rights should be established to contribute to the evolution of and compliance with human rights. And for the resolution, we have Professor Martin Scheinen to my right. Uh, he is uh, a professor of international law and human rights and dean of the graduate studies program at the law department at European University Institute in Florence. Uh, he was for many years a professor in Finland in uh, for uh, 10 years, he served also at the Institute of Human Rights in uh, Turku, Finland, teaching both constitutional and human rights. And from 1997 to 2004, he served as the Finnish expert on the UN High Human Rights Committee, uh, which is the treaty body, as you know, that acts under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, in 2005, he was appointed the first UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Counterterrorism, 
uh, in which uh, capacity I had many occasions to meet with him uh, until July 2011. So he will be speaking in favor of the proposition, a world court for human rights should be established to contribute to the evolution of and compliance with human rights law. Uh, speaking against uh, the resolution is Sarah Cleveland. She is the Lewis Henkin Professor of Constitutional and Human Rights at Columbia Law School in New York and co-director of that school's Human Rights Institute. Uh, she is currently the US member of the Human Rights Committee on which uh, Martin Scheinan also served. Uh, from 2009 to 2011, she served as counselor to the legal advisor at the State Department. And she has been for some years now the US member of the Venice Commission for uh, the Rule of Law. She's a native of Alabama and uh, studied at Brown and at Lincoln College uh, as a Rhodes Scholar uh, and has also taught at Oxford uh, over the years uh, since her time um, as a student. So um, here is how it will go. The speaker for the proposition, namely uh, Martin Scheinan, will have 20 minutes to make the case. Uh, I will have these subtle cues, five minutes, <laughs> one minute, <laughs> stop. <laughs> stop means stop. Sure. Um, you'll get a real Donald Trump type, stop <laughs> at 20. Then the speaker for the opposition will have 20 minutes to make the case against, and then there'll be a few questions from the chair, that's myself, and then we will move on to the next round. So, um, the proposition, a world court for human rights should be established to contribute to the evolution of and compliance with human rights law in favor, uh, Professor Scheinan. Thank you very much, Harold, and thanks to all the organizers of the event. I look forward to a good debate. I note that we have two formulation of the formulations of the motion, and I actually like the moderator's formulation better. Promote the evolution and compliance. I probably using an older one, promote respect and compliance. I think the reference to evolution is important because um, I see as one of the main benefits of a future World Court of Human Rights that it will allow the unhindered evolution of human rights law on global level by having a legal judicial authority to clarify the law. To me, uh, it is then secondary that there will be compliance, including incentives for compliance, and ultimately also remedies for victims of human rights violations. I worked on this project uh, together with Professor Manfred Novak, my good Austrian friend and colleague, and we always disagreed a little bit in the sense that he was the one for remedies for victims of violations, whereas I was the one for evolution of the law. And we managed to put our act together and formulate a proposal which meets both ends. So, the idea of a World Court of Human Rights is not as new as many would think. Uh, it was part of the original plan after World War II to proceed in three steps. First, a declaration, then a covenant, and finally a court. This was the official UN Human Rights Plan, of which the first step, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, was realized in 1948. Then came the Cold War, which in many ways hindered the progressive development of human rights uh, at the legal and institutional level, so that the idea of a covenant was split into two covenants, the uh, Covenant of Civil and Political Rights monitored by the Human Rights Committee being one, and then of course there's the Economic Social Cultural Rights Covenant on the side. As part of those Cold War disputes, also the right of individual complaint, which had been one of the main purposes of the original covenant idea, was removed from even from the ICCPR to a separate optional protocol. So it was downgraded a couple of steps, no court, no mandatory complaint procedure, just an optional protocol for those states who wish to allow for individual complaint. That was a very radical idea in the post-World War II situation where 
the old ideas of state sovereignty and non-interference in internal matters would at first sight preclude the existence of an international right of complaint uh, to the right to take your case to the United Nations, so to say. At that time, in 1948, Australia was a protagonist of international uh, protection of human rights, and they had a proposal for an international court of human rights, which was closely modeled uh, along the statute of the International Court of Justice. Um, including as to its provisions of applicable law. But nevertheless, they would have utilized the Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights as a filter body, and then there would have been an International Court of Human Rights. It was to be an international court, meaning a court for states, whereas our idea of a world court goes beyond states as uh, duty bearers and subject to complaints, as we want to open the possibility of complaint also in respect of other actors besides states. There have been important developments in the evolution of human rights law since 1948. Of course, everybody knows by 66, the Universal Declaration was by and large codified into, into binding treaty form through the two covenants of 1966, gradually also other human rights treaties concerning specific rights or spe specific groups. And even more importantly, uh, while many would contest whether the Universal Declaration originally represented universal acceptance of human rights, as it was at that time uh, written and adopted still by a fairly small group of states that then formed the United Nations. Gradually, human rights have become universal through the very traditional mechanism of consent by states through their voluntary ratification. Every state in the world by now has ratified at least some human rights treaties. Human rights are in that sense universal that there is no exception to their binding legal nature. And 99.5% of all states have, in treaty form, accepted the whole catalog of human rights in the Universal Declaration. Explanation. The Convention on the Rights of the Child covers all rights. So most states are parties to that convention. That's already the 99.5. And the sole exception is the United States of America, which hasn't ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child and not either the uh, Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights. So that's an exception. However, one could say 100% if one takes the view that by ratifying the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, you also accept economic and social rights, at least to the degree that there shall be no discrimination, as is proclaimed in Article 5 of the Third Convention. Maybe most interestingly for the evolution in these decades, it needs to be noted that already 95% of states have accepted the right of international complaint or in rare cases, instead an alternative uh, mechanism of, so to say, intrusive human rights monitoring. That would be the inquiry procedures of certain treaties. Also, the US is a party to complaint procedures between states, even if not the right of individual complaint. And three quarters of all states in the world have accepted the right of individual complaint, most often under the ICCPR, in some cases not under the ICCPR, but under some other treaties such as the uh, Women's Convention or the Economic Social Rights Covenant. So we see surprisingly high degree of consent by states through voluntary ratification of treaties and gradual acceptance of the right of complaint, which originally was a distant utopia. Parallel to this development of broadening consent, we also have an evolution of human rights law towards an objectively binding legal framework of constitutional nature that is above individual states, including above their consent as to the details. This can be said to represent international rule of law as constitutions bound the state and the king to the law. Equally, human rights treaties have had the same function of becoming law above states and could be said to form a basis for substantive constitutionalism in international law.
You can refer to them as treaty-based law, you can refer to them as customary international law, or even as Juskogens, but the evolution has been towards many human rights norms, if not all, becoming law above the will of individual states. We have regional developments, especially in Europe, where human rights have become part of the regional public order or regional constitutional order uh, of a continent, uh, primarily through the operation of the European Court of Human Rights. And then at international level, at global level, at UN level, we would have the UN Human Rights Committee, of which Sarah Cleveland is a member, uh, be representing an embryonic form of a future World Court of Human Rights. It's the closest we have come so far. And there are quite important uh, forms of evolution through which the Human Rights Committee has contributed towards the emergence of human rights law moving from consent to constitution. In the early 1990s, the committee opened the path for uh, the doctrine of continuity of obligations where the dissolution of a state that previously was bound by a treaty uh, meant simply that all the new successor states are equally bound. That has been applied in relation to ceding over territory from the UK to China, Hong Kong, and to a situation where there is an international administration, Kosovo. In all cases, the entity which exercises sovereignty is considered bound by pre-existing human rights obligations. Um, the Human Rights Committee, in its famous general comment 24, said impermissible reservations, reservations that are contrary to the object and purpose of the covenant, are subject to review and may be without legal effect through severing them from the main acceptance of the treaty as a whole. The committee has developed an interesting and quite extensive doctrine on extraterritorial human rights obligations, meaning that human rights norms are not simply binding upon a state within its own territory, but also wherever it acts. And one of Sarah Cleveland's predecessors as US member of the committee, Lou Henkin, was one of the prime authors of the Grave Breaches Doctrine in relation to interim measures of protection. The Covenant, as other UN human rights treaties, doesn't include a clause on the committee's authority to issue interim uh, measures requests. But nevertheless, when the Philippines disregarded such a request by e executing a number of individuals who had taken their case to the Human Rights Committee, the committee said non-compliance with a soft request of interim measures of protection represents a grave breach of the covenant framework because it's a denial of the right of individual complaint that the state has voluntarily accepted. Then there are bigger challenges which represent um, a paradigm shift uh, towards human rights law becoming more than that's just law for states. We are speaking of the so-called process of globalization, which means the emergence of other equally powerful actors at the side of states, international organizations, international financial institutions, multinational corporations, which today all have the capacity to affect the enjoyment of human rights on the ground. And part of the globalization process has been deregulation in the sense that nation states are not able to protect the rights of their uh, citizens or residents fully in relation to influences that come from above and from abroad. Therefore, there is a need for accountability of international organizations uh, and uh, taking more seriously than before the role of private actors as human rights violations because the relative weakening of the state means that you can only uh, cover part of human rights violations through addressing the state. There's also another challenge of fragmentation of international law where um, the, uh, the, the fragmentation of the UN human rights treaty system itself is just one element of us getting conflicting messages from different uh, regimes in international law and even within human rights law from different bodies. All these are good reasons for creating a world court of human rights, which in a nutshell, has the following features. The uh, draft statute that we five years ago wrote with my colleague Manfred Novak and uh, Julia Kosma, also at his institute in Vienna, 
is jurisdictional in nature. We propose no new substantive human rights norms, but simply reliance on the existing treaty framework so that the um, uh, complaint mechanism through the court would be based on pre-existing human rights treaties. No need to renegotiate, no need to amend, just accepting the jurisdiction of a new body. This new body, the World Court of Human Rights, would have legally binding powers to issue interim measures to um, uh, examine the effect of reservations as to whether they are contrary to the object and purpose of human rights, to pronounce on whether there was a human rights violation, and to order binding remedies. There is also a collective dimension to the remedies in the form of a trust fund, which will help in providing remedies to victims of human rights violations, even in cases where the state itself or the entity against which the case was adjudicated will be bankrupt or unable to uh, prov provide for restitution. There is a need for better political clout at the United Nations level. One of the failures of the current system is that the uh, UN Human Rights Council has not lived up to the challenge in the sense that it would be unconditionally monitoring and enforcing decisions, for instance, from the treaty bodies. It does its own political second guessing. Here we propose that the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights would have an oversight function and when needed could then trigger the Human Rights Council or even the Security Council to enforce the legally binding judgments of the World Court of Human Rights. We wrote specific provisions concerning the possibility of what we call entities also to accept the jurisdiction of the World Court of Human Rights, not only states, but also international organizations, including international financial institutions, multinational corporations, and also certain um, uh, regional or ethnic or religious minority groups who have a degree of autonomy could also accept the right of international individual complaint by opening the jurisdiction of the court. So it would mean broadening the coverage of uh, human rights obligations through um, enabling complaints not only against states but also other types of actors. This of course is a response to the process of globalization, the relative weakening of the nation state as the, uh, uh, as the duty bearer in relation to human rights norms. One dimension in the provisions related to the right of complaint is the traditional requirement of exhaustion of domestic remedies before you can take your case to the international level. We have developed this idea so that there would be incentives for both states and non-state entities to create a functioning framework of internal or domestic remedies so that they could provide human rights protection already at home and hence avoid the need to take a case to the World Court of Human Rights. In that sense, even if this is a demanding, uh, ambitious idea, there is a degree of subsidiarity also in our proposal. It will, the World Court will kick in only when uh, remedies at home within an international organization, within a human rights panel of a multinational corporation, or at the nation state level have failed. And we expect that ultimately corporations that will join the jurisdiction of the World Court of Human Rights will design their own internal grievance mechanisms that need to be exhausted before taking the case to an international World Court of Human Rights. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we do, do not think that the uh, World Court will be overwhelmed with a flow of cases. It may be that there will be a need to have a filtering function built in within the court, but primarily we, we believe that by, um, by encouraging compliance and rewarding compliance, the uh, establishment of a world court will result in the improvement and better functioning of internal remedies so that the court will be needed for um, pilot 
judgments in big cases that represent the need for the evolution of human rights law. The evolution of human rights law was part of the formulation of the motion, and I see it as the most important future function for a unifying uh, judicial body. Nobody could imagine in 1948 what would be the sophistication of uh, human rights law by 2016. We have opened new books and new pages in new books uh, as to what is covered by particular individual provisions of human rights. This is a natural development which is not over. There will be new challenges, new societal challenges resulting from technology, resulting from scarcity of resources or new innovations that will mean that always there will be new issues on the human rights agenda and there will be a need for uh, authoritative determination as to what constitutes a human rights violation and what not. Finally, uh, the World Court of Human Rights is a cure to fragmentation in the sense that the court would be a sort of appeal body above the existing treaty bodies. The mechanism for the acceptance of this jurisdiction is written in the way that uh, joining the World Court will suspend the operation of existing optional complaint procedures. Those complaint procedures would be in place for other states still, and hence uh, new legal issues could be brought either to existing treaty bodies or to the World Court, depending on which case, which state or which entity, in the case of World Court, is subject to the uh, adjudication. Uh, also internally, the court would have a function of sitting in seven judge chambers and a plenary court, which if needed is an appeal instance securing consistency between uh, the rulings. There is a clause uh, on applicable law in the draft statute which secures that uh, human rights, all human rights in separate human rights treaties will be applied uh, <coughs> uh, through the principles of interdependence and div indivisibility of human rights and taking into account uh, general international law and general principles of law and hence this is a form of avoiding separation of human rights law from general international law and rather encouraging a reading of human rights treaties that at the same time seeks to integrate the regime of human rights with general international law. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good afternoon, everyone. I would first like to start out by thanking DAPO and the Martin School for organizing this very interesting exercise, um, which I'm sure that um, Martin and I have both enjoyed preparing for. Um, and as because I'm currently a sitting member of the UN Human Rights Committee, I'm obligated to say that nothing that I say here uh, necessarily refers, um, reflects the views of the Human Rights Committee. Um, I was reflecting to DAPO earlier that my memory when I was a student at Oxford was of the river being closed for six weeks because of pouring frigid rain in the months from January to March, uh, which means that this weather, uh, which I've assured my kids for the last six years on Downton Abbey was completely fake and unrepresentative of England, apparently is representative of England, at least for today. Um, so it's great to be here on such a beautiful day. Now the question is, the resolution is, should there be a world court of human rights? Maybe in an ideal world there should be, but I think I, also in an ideal world we wouldn't need one. So I'm here in my capacity as a scholar, a practitioner, and a lifelong advocate for human rights. I've devoted my career to trying to make the human rights system more effective and protective for real people on the ground. And the same is true for Professor Shinen. And the states that support the idea of a world court are genuinely supportive of human rights, Switzerland, Norway, Austria. 
I could be debating this point from a very different perspective. I could be up here arguing in defense of state sovereignty. I could be expressing sharp skepticism about the effectiveness of any supranational institutions. I could be expressing skepticism over the universality of human rights. But that is not our perspective. And I think actually what we're here to talk about today is what is the best way today to improve human rights protection around the world? And is it the creation of a world court of human rights? My answer is no, for two simple reasons. It's the wrong time, and it's the wrong idea. Very straightforward. First, it's the wrong time. We're in the realm of Shakespeare. Shakespeare reminded us in King Lear, ripeness is all, right? Ripeness is all. We're at the high watermark since the end of the Cold War of state skepticism to multinational institutions and superhuman, right, supranational human rights oversight mechanisms. States are withdrawing from or threatening to withdraw from human rights mechanisms as we have not seen before. In the European Convention system, we are holding this debate in a state that is threatening to withdraw from both the European Union and the European Convention on Human Rights, or at least to replace domestic implementation of the European Convention with a freestanding UK Bill of Rights. Last year, Russia, its constitutional court asserted the primacy of Russian national law over European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence. In the inter-American system, Venezuela denounced the American Convention in 2012, thereby withdrawing from the contentious jurisdiction of the inter-American court. Peru similarly attempted to withdraw in 2009, following an earlier withdrawal by Eastern Caribbean states. The ICC is confronting an ongoing conversation about the mass possibility of an African withdrawal from the court. In the ICJ, in March, the president of Colombia announced that Colombia would no longer participate in ICJ proceedings involving Nicaragua, describing the court's recognition of jurisdiction in that case as illegitimate and flawed. The European Inter-American and UN treaty body systems have all recently seen assertive pushes for reform initiated by hostile states, states reacting to unfavorable rulings in ways that looked more like an attempt at a hostile takeover of these systems than a true reform effort. We are seeing a rise of skepticism about entering the, into major new multilateral conventions across the board. A few years ago, Kyoto was the way we addressed climate change. Now we address it through soft law Paris Climate Accords. States have also rejected the creation of new oversight mechanisms, even soft ones. So in December of last year, states rejected the establishment of an extraordinarily soft mechanism for discussing IHL issues at the International Conference of States Parties to the Geneva Conventions. We've also finally seen the rise of BRIC states, the assertion of national sovereignty arguments and a new assertiveness by Russia and China on the international stage that have all raised questions whether the multilateral international law world order is in crisis or disintegrating. Now, as Professor Shinen said, the idea of a world court has been with us, with us since the post-war period. And I think if you think about pursuing an idea, it's important to think about why the idea has not succeeded before. And the reason it has not succeeded before is because states would not agree to it. The reason we have the treaty body system and not a world court of human rights is because states would not agree to it. I don't think that has fundamentally changed. In 2006, a reform effort was put on the table to unify the then existing treaty bodies into a single uniform treaty body system with no more enhanced authorities than it currently has. And states would not even agree to that, much less ambitious proposal. So the timing seems exceptionally poor to be contemplating creation of a world court of human rights. Second, it's the wrong idea. I think that it could be destructive, not constructive, to the international human rights system. 
The core question, as I said, is how to best improve human rights protection. And I think this is not the way. Our current system of human rights protection is starving. It is underfunded, understaffed, and insufficiently empowered. A World Court of Human Rights would first further divert energy and resources, suck oxygen from our existing mechanisms. Second, it would not remedy the problem of lack of comprehensive coverage and enforcement of human rights. Third, the pr particular proposal, I think, has significant design challenges, although I will not focus on those. And then fourth, the focus on a court, I think, perpetuates an overemphasis on judicial solutions as opposed to focusing our energies on prevention, internalization, and promotion of a culture of human rights and the rule of law that will ensure that human rights will be respected on the ground. We live in an era of many norms and institutions and inadequate implementation. There is high fragmentation and a lack of systematic coordination among the existing regional and international human rights mechanisms, which are being given less funding rather than more. So I would urge us instead to focus on strengthening and bolstering the mechanisms that we have. And what are those? Between 1969 and 2011, 10 UN treaty bodies were uh, were created with a total of 172 experts. These all are people who work part-time, totally unpaid, without support staff, without resources. This period also saw the proliferation of other mechanisms in the UN system, in the Human Rights Council, working groups, special rapporteurs, commissions of inquiry, the Universal Periodic Review. It brought the separate development of regional systems, the European Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American Commission and Court, the African Commission and Court on Human and People's Rights, the Arab Committee for Human Rights, as well as regional political mechanisms in the OAS and Europe. Since the mid-1990s, we have also seen the proliferation of international ad hoc and hybrid criminal courts. We are extraordinarily good at creating new treaties and new institutions but much less good at devoting the long-term sustained attention and resources that are necessary to ensure that they are effective. Instead, we create a new institution. We say, that's done, we'll move on. I think that the modern challenge in a world of many under-resourced and at times overlapping institutions is how out of the patchwork cacophony of the current human rights system to ensure that these institutions function as a larger coherent whole, to better link them to civil society, make them accessible to victims, heighten their effectiveness in influencing states, and maximize their capacity as catalysts for the elaboration and protection of human rights. In other words, this is the challenge of what I call our current age of connectivity. How do we leverage the system we have to make the whole better than the parts? I think the answer is not to create a world court of human rights. Such a court first would divert needed resources from this system. I said the current system is starving. I should say all the institutions I'm about to discuss do a remarkable job, particularly in light of the limited resources that they have, but they could do more if they were adequately resourced. I mentioned the treaty body system, severely under-resourced. Recent reports indicated that the state periodic re reporting system is only sustainable because so many states don't report or they don't report on time. If they did report or reported on time, we would not remotely have the resources uh, to hear from them. There's no funding for follow-up or oversight with states. There's inadequate accessibility for the whole system. We have inadequate webcasting, inadequate web uh, resources and promotion of the decisions and activities so that they are in fact accessible to states who want to comply, to civil society that wants to help states comply and to victims. And there's no resources available for the treaty body system, for the treaty bodies to exchange ideas and discuss ways to function better, either with each other 
or with other regional and international mechanisms. The European Court of Human Rights. Strasbourg is the best resource of all the human rights mechanisms. It has a budget of about 71 million euros a year. By contrast, the European Court of Justice has a budget of 357 million dollars a year. With a jurisdiction of, of, of only, of less than 30 states, as opposed to the 47 in the European, in the Council of Europe. There's a backlog of the European Court of 67,000 cases, a significant improvement uh, from the past, but nevertheless, many, many cases pending. More resources are desperately needed that, by that court for translation of key judgments into the different languages of the states that are involved in order to better engage effectively with local authorities. This is essential if the principle of subsidiarity is to be respected and national judges are to be able to apply the convention in the disputes before them. We need more resources for the enforcement of judgments. You could establish an expert body to engage with states and conduct missions to meet with authorities and push for change. Resources could be used for educating national judges and prosecutors about the jurisprudence of the court and state obligations. Fact-finding, site visits, is an authority of the court, but they lack the funding to conduct these. It's been estimated that fact-finding, a site visit in an individual case, will cost $50,000 once you take account of translation, travel, recording, lodging, witness per diems, et cetera. Therefore, these missions are not carried out. There's a similar proposal for the world court to be able to do this. The question is who will pay for it? Fact-finding in interstate cases only happens in Strasbourg. Insight negotiation for friendly settlement. The court used to do this more. It lacks the resources to do it. Insight, friendly settlement is often the best way to encourage bringing out change. Finally, the court lacks funding to engage even with the other human rights mechanisms of the Council of Europe. The, the Framework Convention, the Venice Commission, the Committee on the Prevention of Torture within Europe, all of these institutions work on a shoestring and need more resources to be able to work better by themselves and more effectively with each other. The Inter-American system, worse. The Inter-American Commission is seriously underfunded, has a significant backlog. It can take 11 years to move a case through the Inter-American Commission before you get to the court. Here I will focus on the court. The court is a five-member court with contentious jurisdiction over 20 states, approximately 560 million people. It has the smallest budget of any international court. Its regular budget from the OAS is 2.7 million. The court augments this by going around cap in hand, seeking voluntary contributions from states and international institutions. Its budget now is being sharply cut as a result of the announcement by European supporters of the inter-American system that they are now diverting funds that they previously have given to the court to deal, to deal with the refugee crisis in Europe. In 2014, the court's total budget was 5.6 million US. Last year, it was 4.5 million US. It may well lose another 1.5 million this year, leaving it with only 3 million. The court has a backlog of 9,673 petitions pending initial review as of the end of last year. Because of the cut in funding, it is facing a 50% cut in personnel in the legal department. It is facing having to reduce its number of sessions from 14 weeks per year to eight. And it's suffering damage to the Legal Assistance Fund for Victims, which is used to provide assistance to people who do not have adequate resources themselves to litigate before the court. Even when it's fully funded, the court doesn't have funding for basic services. The judges work part-time and are paid accordingly. They have no direct support staff, including secretarial support. There are no translation there's no funding for translation of judgments into all the official languages of the OAS. 
translations are slow and there are insufficient resources for quality control. There are no standing paid positions, permanent positions for salaries for offices and lawyers, and therefore limited opportunities for professional career advancement. No department for internal and external communications and no funding for relations with other, either with states or with other human rights institutions. And finally, funding for unassisted and unrepresented victims is inadequate. The court estimates that the minimum budget needed to secure a tribunal that would have basic services up to the standards of ordinary national courts would be US $18 million a year or four times its 2015 budget. By contrast, a world court of human rights would be very expensive. It would require translation into multiple languages, a building, location, the lengthy and burdensome development of new procedures to get a new court up and running. We recently experienced this with the creation of the International Criminal Court. And I think the International Criminal Court has had an important role in contributing to attention to uh, enforcement of international criminal law against uh, the most responsible. However, think about it. The ICC has 34 judges, over 700 staff, an annual budget of 166 million, and in 12 years, the first 12 years, it secured two convictions. These are very expensive institutions to establish. Second, it won't solve the problem, a world court of human rights. The core problem is that not all human rights are currently enforceable, that where there's a right, there should be a remedy, and yet in many parts of the world, there isn't. But I think a world court of human rights will simply replicate this problem at the global level, not solve it. Despite what Professor Scheinan said, states have not accepted the individual complaint mechanism of many treaty bodies. Only 58 states have accepted the CERDS individual complaint mechanism, 27 states for the Committee on the Rights of the Child, 12 states for the Economic Social Rights Committee, and only three declarations for migrant workers. Contentious jurisdiction of the institutions we have is limited. The ICJ has contentious jurisdiction over 72 states, the Inter-American Court over 20, Seven states currently have accepted the individual complaints mechanism for the African Court of Human and People's Rights. I will leave to aside the specific design of the current uh, proposal and finally articulate a concern over the over-judicialization of the promotion of human rights uh, writ large. Courts help secure remedies, they're very important, but too much focus can cause us to neglect the important role for prevention and promotion of rule of law structures that are essential to compliance with human rights. So I will close by asking, in a world of limited resources, if you were asked by your government to advise it today, May 9, 2016, whether to vote its limited resources to the promotion and creation of a world court of human rights or if it should contribute to ensuring that our existing regimes actually are capable of accomplishing what they were designed to do, I would ask you to vote against the World Court for Human Rights. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for uh, two cogent presentations. Now you have uh, questions from the chair. Uh, they will be two, two for each of the uh, speakers. Uh, they will be followed by uh, the speaker for the proposition, Mr. Scheinin, responding both to Professor Cleveland's remarks and to the questions from the chair. Then five minutes for Professor Cleveland to do the same, respond to the questions from the other side and my questions. This will then lead to a general discussion for about 40 minutes where members of the audience can pose questions. They should be short and questions. Uh, if, if I hear a speech, you're cut off. Uh, and then uh, there will be two minutes for the speaker for the proposition to close, two minutes for the speaker against the proposition to close, 
and then we will take a tally. And we have um, several folks in the audience who um, are, are the uh, uh, designated um, toll takers or counters. So uh, my two questions to Professor Scheinin. Number one, uh, the Bernie Sanders question sounds great. How do you get there? That's it. <laughs> sounds great. How do you play it to get there? Number two, uh, don't we already have a world court of human rights? It's called the International Court of Justice, which ends up hearing, uh, and increasingly so, international human rights cases. Uh, to Professor Cleveland, the, the Hillary Clinton question, uh, isn't what you're saying just an elaborate justification for the status quo? Um, after all, uh, there is a reason that these organizations are so badly resourced, which is that states don't want them to be more powerful than they are. And um, you say now is not the time, now will never be the time. It may well be that uh, if all this coordination and connectivity that you want should happen, why wouldn't it be that the generation of an organization or an institution that would be the focal point would have that kind of catalytic effect? So um, with that, let me sit in the middle. And uh, you have uh, five minutes, uh, Martin, to respond to Sarah and to me. Sarah then has five minutes to respond. Thank you very much. Uh, above all, Professor Cleveland, thank you for your contestation of the motion. Uh, I need to be quite telegrammatic because there are basically four things I, that I want to address in my five minutes. Two from Sarah, two from Harold. Sarah raised quite strongly the issue, is there momentum? Why would this be the time to create a World Court of Human Rights? I'd say we have been in difficult times also before. Let's say when the Human Rights Committee started its work, it was flooded by Uruguayan cases, and it did very well in response. There's been the case of the dissolution of the Soviet Union, dissolution of former Yugoslavia. There's been the effort by North Korea to denounce the ICCPR. There's been tough times before, and, and the human rights system has coped, and not only coped, but it has become stronger by, by confronting the challenges. Uh, I think there would have been a moment for the World Court of Human Rights in 2008, the Obama moment. If President Obama, after his election, had declared the US proposes the creation of a World Court of Human Rights, and we will be the first one to right, so that moment's passed. accept so, uh, the right, right. statute. Well, the Why next not? moment can be the successor of Putin or democratization of Saudi Arabia. I admit there needs to be momentum, but we cannot exclude that there will be moments in history well, also when, in the future. That, why would that be? Why? No, when? Uh, when? It can be in three years, you it said, can uh, be in four not, years. Now is not the time. When now will be is the time, the time to. Uh, prepare the basis by having a statute which is then can be promote, proposed by the next Obama. So that it's ready for adoption, ready for action. The second main line of argument you by... You mean uh, Hillary Obama? <laughs> is that what you think? <laughs> for instance. The, the second well, I mean, main she's line... The, uh, she's the candidate, uh, like of, the candidate. Is that something you would propose for her? Of argument by Professor Cleveland was the resources issue. And I've given this some thought, and I think the European Court of Human Rights is really the model. And I think for world-level developments, the European Court of Human Rights saves a lot of money. And one way to illustrate is to, to compare what's the cost of a case at the International Criminal Court, what's the cost of a case in the Human Rights Court. And the, the dimensions are not 10 times not 100 times, but 500 or 1,000 times more expensive to pursue the route of international criminal court cases as compared to international human rights court cases. And we see the World Court of Human Rights replicating the European Court of Human Rights model. I admit institution building will create initial cost, but ultimately the cost of a case will not be much larger than at the European Court of Human Rights, and that will help us save expenditure as compared to resulting in situations because of bad human rights protections where there's a need for a criminal case. Criminal cases are hugely expensive. 
especially when they are of international nature. It's not only that UN institutions are so efficient and wasteful of money. Uh, I don't blame either one of you for the existence of Guantanamo, but the military commissions in Guantanamo, Guantanamo are equally expensive than the International, court, uh, international Criminal Court when you count the cost of a case. Let's have human rights mechanisms strengthened, including judicial ones, and we hope to uh, save money instead of wasting it. Uh, let's say if only 10% of the money spent on international criminal tribunals was put into, put into all human rights mechanisms together, including the World Court of Human Rights, we would uh, be safe and have all uh, the mechanisms function. Then the two questions by the chair. How do you get there? The short answer is 30. 30 states would accept the jurisdiction of um, the World Court of Human Rights. That's the model we propose in the statute. And that's how the existing complaint mechanisms have functions. Functions when the ICCPR was written with its optional protocol, 10 states were needed for the entry into force of the optional protocol, which resulted in the optional protocol entering into force at the same time as the covenant. And gradually, uh, two thirds of all states in the world have joined. Is it 114 so 30, 30 today? States with uh, 3 million total population. We start with 30 states with 30 million total Andorra, population. Vanuatu. <laughs> and the Nordics. <laughs> and then the second question was, we already have the International Court of Justice. I think that's a third best model, that we would develop the International Court of Justice with a similar idea of having the unifying, integrating, uh, idea of applying human rights law as an appeal instance above the treaty bodies in light of general international law, but we would have to fix the procedural issue of access, of standing. There would have to be a way to get your cases to the International Court of Justice not being a state. We can talk about that, and I'm happy to draft it with you, Harold. Okay, so uh, the the questions were, um, isn't it the same old, same old, and Tracy Chapman, if not now, then when, right? Um, first, with respect to the, isn't it the same old, same old, clearly not. I mean, I think the whole point of my remarks was, we have a patchwork human rights system. The patchwork part of it would not be remedied by a world court of human rights. But we could unquestionably make the systems that we have much more effective and much better functioning if they were adequately resourced, if they had full-time personnel and full-time staff, if they had resources to do site visits, if they had resources to do follow-up, to train states, and, and in particular to create access mechanisms for civil society and victims so that civil society and victims can actually uh, leverage these mechanisms. Now, when I say the patchwork problem, won't change. Part of the concern is that we have whole swaths of the globe that are not subject to any binding adjudicatory oversight, right? There's no Asian Court of Human Rights. There's no Middle East Court of Human Rights. Those countries are not going to be standing up to ratify a World Court of Human Rights. Professor Koh is absolutely right. The reason that our current regimes are starved is because Many states don't want them to be effective, but those same states won't want a World Court of Human Rights, even more so, particularly if it's likely to be effective. So either they won't join it, or perhaps worse, they will elect people to it who aren't promoting the protection of human rights, but indeed are securing the regression of human rights doctrine. We can't assume that an institution we create will so, definitely so what have, would get them will have positive outcomes. Sorry? What would get these institutions more resources? Well, if there is in fact any momentum among states for ensuring that human rights are better protected, my argument is those resources should go into the current system. Prof Professor Scheinan's uh, proposal also assumes that states are going to be willing to come up with more resources and more commitments. If they're not, then none of this is happening. The window of opportunity, 2008, was not a window of opportunity. Why were the Paris Accords a soft law mechanism, not a treaty? 
because the U.S. can't ratify a multilateral treaty, and in many cases doesn't want to. But the U.S. requires 67 votes in the U.S. Senate in order to be able to ratify a treaty, which is why we're not party to the CEDAW Convention or the Convention on the Rights of the Child or many of the other long-standing human rights conventions. The U.S. is not a party to any individual complaint mechanism in any supranational body other than that in the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. President Obama, no U.S. president in you know, the near to midterm is going to stand up and advocate for the creation of a world court of human rights. Why wouldn't Hillary Clinton, if she cares so much about uh, human rights violations against women? Hillary Clinton is one, a very pragmatic person, and two, she tried to get CEDAW ratified when she was Secretary of State and the Disabilities Convention, and she couldn't do it. And the Disabilities Convention is modeled on the Americans with Disabilities Act. So the, you're just not going to get the political support there, and she's a realist, and she would know that. But why isn't this a uh, catalyst for getting more action? That's what Martin's saying. I think the real catalysts actually are our current regional systems and the treaty bodies. And I think that there is a value in having a discourse among those regimes and different sort of laboratories of experimentation where jurisprudence can percolate up in one system and transfer and be picked up in another. I would actually be very cautious about having some single 12 member World Court of Human Rights that could quash that kind of organic evolution of human rights law at the regional level. We say 21. 21. It <laughs> then it's more expensive. <laughs> okay. Um, That's 22. So uh, we have questions, time for questions from the audience. What we'll do is we'll take uh, two questions uh, di directed toward each speaker and then let them answer. So please ask one question, and then if we have two toward one, we'll uh, keep going until we get two for the other. Yeah. And uh, please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Rick Bjorga, Jesus College, Oxford. Surely there's a realist or conservative case for a world court of human rights. You sometimes hear criticisms of the European Court of Human Rights and the Inter-American Inter Court of Human Rights they go too far, they're too dynamic, they're too liberal. Is it not possible from a realist, conservative point of view to say that we need an international organ, something like the ICJ, that will you know, bring parental or an adult supervision uh, over and above all these crazy regional bodies? I mean, I think that criticism is exaggerated, but is that not possible to say that that is what states would want? They could pack it with their, with their legal advices and they could sort of rein in the regional bodies. Thank you. Are, are you directing the question to both? Yes, please. OK, then we have one more question for each. Uh, good afternoon, uh, both of you. Thank you very much for both of your remarks. Uh, my question is about the issue of fragmentation, which I to, think to Martin who? alluded to. to. Sorry, uh, my question is alluded to both if both would like to answer. My name's Benjamin. I'm from Baleo College. Yeah, so I agree that in terms of resources, both sides are going to have difficulties in terms of achieving the end goal. But would fragmentation possibly be better achieved as a world court eventually? Because even if we can have lots of comparative overviews and discussions between different kinds of human rights bodies and different treaties, at the end of the day, you do need someone who consolidates and gives a sort of objective assessment of what might work or what might not work. So in a sense, that sort of meta-level analysis might still be useful as a contribution, even if it's not the definitive final word on what international human rights means. Would you like to go first? I, th I think they were actually the same question. <laughs> in the sense that by addressing the threat of fragmentation and the trends of fragmentation, the World Court of Human, court of Human Rights needs to be a realist court, in the sense that it tries to build bridges not only between human rights treaties and human rights treaty regimes, but also between human rights law and general international law. And I think there, there will be a lot of expectation towards that kind of a novel body, that it doesn't isolate itself from, let's say, mainstream public international law. 
and it ha would have to, more than existing human rights courts, um, detach itself from looking at a single human rights provision, but to, but to see the broader picture. And in, 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 in that sense, I think it addresses the issue of fragmentation rather than contributes toward fragmentation. And it also provides a realistic prospect of, uh, of being a court with which the states can live with, um, being dynamic in the sense that accepting a role of a, of a vanguard, a pilot, where new human rights issues emerge. But beyond that, also trying to find a common denominator between different human rights systems and different human rights re 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 regimes. So I, I would say that it could very well be a half conservative court, which maybe is the, the, the long-term contribution of the European Court of Human Rights, which never has been radical, even if it at the same time has been evolutive in identifying new human rights issues and taking forward the understanding of human rights law, even if not being radical. What, what do you mean by a half conservative court? Uh, the US Supreme Court with Scalia dead is a half conservative court. I mean, half it's conservative not, court. It's not making a lot of progress these days. So. In the sense that, of course, the European Court of Human Rights is, is quite doctrinal and limited by the, by the uh, narrow scope of its provisions and the, uh, in some cases, narrow reading of its provisions. And the evaluative uh, development takes place now and then, but not continuously. Uh, I think those people who accuse the European Court of Human Rights being the jack-in-the-box coming with great surprises now and then, I think they are wrong. They are reading the court incorrectly, and they don't see how it actually is quite cautious and acting in a piecemeal fashion to, to recognize the emergence of new human rights issues. And, I'm just expect, expecting the same from the World Court. Professor. I'll, I'll start with fragmentation first. If the, if the question was, won't a World Court of Human Rights help solve the fragmentation issue, if that's the question, I think the answer is no. And I think it's particularly no with respect to the proposal that's on the table, which I haven't um, addressed too specifically. But the idea is a very sweeping one where non-state actors and institutions could themselves voluntarily accept the jurisdiction of the court in which the court could uh, order very sweeping remedies in which states could decide for themselves which treaties of the 21 human rights treaties that the court would have jurisdiction over and which provisions of which treaties the court would have jurisdiction over with respect to each state. So you could have a very a la carte uh, acceptance of jurisdiction of this court, where a court accepted its jurisdiction over one aspect of one article in one treaty, could claim to be a party to the court, and the court wouldn't have jurisdiction over it. And then you would have different countries before the court that had ratified different treaties, and therefore, the obligations with respect to torture for one in that court would be different with, than the obligations with respect to torture for right, another. Right. So this is a very, very complicated um, and I think a not fragmentation solving proposal. But and when, it would when, be when, interposed when, when on top can, of uh, the existing system. When you can eat a la carte, don't you go to the restaurant more? <laughs> Well, but this could be the problem, right? That, that states would want to take credit for joining it, but not actually committing to it. And then you would just have another fragmented patchwork layer of human rights treaty oversight. Uh, with respect to, would it, could it be a conservative court? Yes, it could be a conservative court. Um, I think that's not the goal necessarily of those who are advocating for it. Uh, but for example, if you are someone who thinks that officials, former officials, should be held accountable for committing gross human rights violations such as genocide and torture, you would not be enthusiastic about the, inter the ICJ's recent jurisprudence, uh, which was quite sovereignty protective and not human rights promoting. Um, so there's been a tension between the evolution of erosion of recognition of sovereign immu or official immunity in national and regional jurisdictions versus the, the recent interpretation of the ICJ. So I view that as a warning to the human rights advocates who are supporting the creation of such a court. 
And then finally, just with respect to efficacy, the ultimate enforcement mechanism of this court is the Human Rights Council, maybe the, U the UPR regime, or resort to the Security Council. We know how effective those are in securing state compliance with judgments. And how would a victim access this court? How would someone who speaks Lao or Swahili access this court? And if they could access this court, what would be the translation and interpretation costs that would go along with it? We don't want to create, we're not going to promote the rights of victims by creating an elitist, inaccessible, expensive international human rights institution. May I? Please. Well, I think, I think there we have to rely on civil society, which often means human rights NGOs. That's the only way we prevent uh, human rights courts and bodies becoming elitist, irrespective of the language of the proceedings. The a la carte issue, I wanted to address in the sense that uh, the default option is the right of complaint, the jurisdiction of the court is recognized in relation to all of my existing human rights treaty obligations. I'm a state now. And then there would be an opt-out possibility. And in that sense, the a la carte is more like an all-you-can-eat buffet than a, than a tapas bar where you pay for each little, tiny little piece. That there would be certain benefits of accepting, in total, the jurisdiction of the court. But indeed, you could carve out exceptions and space. The point is that then you would continue to be bound by the existing treaties and their monitoring mechanisms. So it, a state would be creating for itself little trouble by having different procedures for different uh, human rights issues. In a sense, our proposal uh, follows the ICJ model in that the applicable law would be different from case to case. It always will depend on what are the parties and what are their uh, international law obligations that the ICJ applies. And so here, for the uh, World Court of Human Rights, the applicable law would d depend on what human rights the uh, state in question has accepted as being subject to the jurisdiction of the court. That is true. But therefore, we have the integration clause of read in the light of all other human rights treaties and read in the light of general international law. So it's a... Uh... Other questions from the audience? Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. I have... Um... Two questions, am I allowed to ask two? Or? Uh, yes, what's your name? My name's Kate Jones. I'm director of the Foreign Service Program here at Oxford. Um, my first question is, as a diplomat, I would like to hear more from Martin Scheinin on really why it's worth adding this tool to the to toolbox. What, how can you demonstrate that the practical uh, value you would add to the implementation of human rights on the ground would be sufficient to actually make it worth creating this, this tool as opposed to focusing on, on current systems or capacity building and so on. My second question as a lawyer is really about consent. Isn't the source of both the strength but sometimes uh, the instability or the skepticism that Sarah Cleveland referred to in human rights law that, that sometimes it runs ahead of state consent in terms of its evolution, both through its courts, through its treaty monitoring bodies and, and other forms of, uh, forms of development. Is there a risk that if you create a court which is charged with the evolution of the court, the evolution of the law, you depart more and more from consent and therefore increase that instability, perhaps more than the strength that you gain as, as a result, particularly when you don't have the emerging consensus of a regional area to rely on? Thank you. So I take it that both of those are directed toward Martin. Uh, do we have other questions for Professor Cleveland? <laughs> Nope, nope. Uh, I'll ask a professor, Cleveland. <laughs> you, you just said that the ICJ has strict rules of sovereign immunity, uh, but it may well be that the International Criminal Court will take relatively few cases. Doesn't that create a zone in which you could use a, Europe, uh, a, a world court for human rights for, um, say, examining uh, 
whether particular kinds of actions, uh, cyber conflict or use of drones, uh, do or do not violate human rights against certain high officials. So let me start with Martin. You can answer these two and then Sarah. Yeah, I think the two questions were closely interrelated. I, at least I understand them so. And, and my short answer is that, that human rights mechanisms and human rights law has been subject to continuous challenge or, or kind of a ebb and flow of challenges from the side of the states. And experience tells that the mechanisms need to stand up to the challenges. And that's why I think a stronger mechanism has better potential of responding in a firm way into the, to the responding to those challenges that come from the side of states. We have had withdrawals from the ICCPR optional protocol. We have had terrible reservations that have needed to be contested. We have had the effort of uh, North Korea to denounce the covenant as a whole. And uh, we have had the uh, sad inter-American convention developments that Sarah re referred to. And I think always the answer is that there needs to be a response, and that response is not only from human rights bodies themselves, but from states as a community. And I remember quite well in 1997, which was for me one of the cases where I was involved, the North Korea denunciation of the ICCPR, how the Human Rights Committee was the vanguard to develop a doctrinal position why this is not possible under the terms of the ICCPR. And then states came on board and supported that position, which then convinced North Korea that they remain a party to the ICCPR. I don't know how much that has helped the situation on the ground in North Korea, but at least they are a party, of the, party to the ICCPR. Well, that's a good question. Is that a meaningful outcome? Well, I think it's always... Isn't it, isn't it worse that North Korea pretends to be a party to the ICCPR when they have absolutely no interest in complying with any of their provisions? It provides for an opening. Of course, they haven't join the individual complaint mechanism, but it provides for an opening for a dialogue when the time comes. Uh, I was on the Human Rights Committee when North Korea once came with the report, and I think that was a useful exercise. It didn't survive the domestic challenges, but it was a, at least a serious try to get the human rights monitoring work in relation to the, to the regime in North Korea. Um, so a stronger institution provides added value to the existing mechanisms, is the short answer. Uh, so Harold, with respect to your question, I think it's actually related to the, the point about consent, uh, which I'd also like to speak to. But if the idea is that a state would only be party to this court, and therefore its nationals and its officials would only be subject to the jurisdiction of this court if the state consented to that jurisdiction and with respect to the treaty provisions mm -hmm. for which the state accepted uh, the court's jurisdiction. I think this would be yet another reason why a number of powerful states wouldn't either join such a court or even necessarily support its creation. And at a minimum, I think as we all know from the ICC experience, they would make sure through a belt and suspenders uh, protection that there would be no possibility of having their officials be subject to the jurisdiction of this court. Who could be subject to the jurisdiction would be the officials of uh, you know, human rights promoting progressive states whose officials would be sued for in some way aiding or assisting human rights violations by other countries that were not... Not the officials, but the states. Right, that were not, exactly, that were not party to the court. Um, right, states. complaints by individuals, but not yeah. Uh, yeah. jurisdiction over individuals. But yes, you're right. But I think, I think <laughs> the consent issue is a really interesting one, because I think, sort of contrary to what was just suggested in the last Q&A round, the, the regional human rights courts have 
flourished in a way, in part because they are closely embedded in a particular regional system, and therefore they get feedback from that system, positive or negative, regarding the approach that they take with respect to particular cases or jurisprudence in general. The more you remove an institution from any particular region or any particular collection of states, the weaker that feedback cycle becomes, which means that the court runs the risk of going off in its own direction, be it progressive or regressive with respect to human rights, and not uh, being subject to a sort of healthy dialogue with the states that are party to it. Uh, I mean, I, I do think it's a very real feature of the regional systems that we can't underestimate here. I'll rephrase my question and direct it to Sarah <laughs> in, instead. So, so Martin started by suggesting that what was um, perhaps most important or certainly very important to him was not so much questions relating to respect for and compliance with the law, but evolution. Mm -hmm. And one could make the case that one of the things that makes human rights so powerful is the claims that it makes. So that the, the norm generation itself is important. And then the, you know, the compliance and respect that follows later on. And what we should really should be concerned with is just generating the norms and developing them in a particular way. Now, to some extent, of course, we already have global institutions like the one you sit on, the Human Rights Committee. But the fact that it's not a court suggests, or one might suggest, means that it doesn't maybe capture the popular imagination. You can't sort of walk to the man in the street and say, what do you think about that latest Human Rights mm -hmm. Committee decision. Mm -hmm. And that if you have a court that generates and you know, develops the norms, that that then strengthens the claims of human rights. It, it, mm -hmm. The norm generation impact is stronger. Um, how would you respond to that argument? Sandy? Um, thank you. Um, I have a question for each. Am I allowed to? And they go in opposite directions. So um, for Professor Scheinan, I, I was wondering about the, pr the problem of the margin of appreciation. Mm -hmm. So in the European Court of Human Rights, it's arguable that when things get tough, uh, they defer back to, to the state through the margin of appreciation. And um, the broader you get, so an, an in, uh, a world court would have even more competing local issues, contested issues. Uh, is the problem on a substantive level that the world court will then defer more by saying that these are local issues which are so contested we should leave them to the domestic authorities and in that sense water down the um, protection of human rights? Um, for Sarah, I have um, a different question going the other direction, which is about opposing fragmentation. So at the moment, um, everyone says that human rights are um, unified and indivisible, but there is really nowhere that um, economic, social and cultural rights can be adjudicated together with civil and political rights, so that the crossover between them, the way in which they interact with each other, isn't able to be aired, at least on an international level, and mostly regional level too. So is it possible that a world court will be able to draw together these two bodies, of, uh, which are really artificially separated, should really influence the decision-making um, together? Thank you. So first Martin, then Sarah. If we have time, I will want at the end to answer Sandra Fredman's question as well, but I'll take uh, now the question of marginal appreciation, her first question. Um, indeed, the European Court of Human Rights started with a marginal appreciation, which I think was 
quite well suited in a situation where it was a question of a small, close-knit group of Western European states, Catholic or Protestant, Northern or Southern, but Western European states. And you could say, let's leave the details for the good guys at back home. I don't think the European Court of Human Rights has been able to stick to that position, but it rather uses now the marginal appreciation doctrine to avoid giving substantive reasons. And it's uh, since the joining of Turkey and Russia that it says marginal appreciation coupled with strict European supervision, which is simply, simply the two parts negate each other, and you can end up with either a violation or non-violation without the re having to substantiate the reasons. So I think marginal appreciation has become an empty shield under the European Convention on Human Rights. In the World Court, we are not proposing a doctrine of marginal appreciation, and I think there's a lot to learn from the Human Rights Committee, which once made a mistake by referring to marginal appreciation, but since then corrected it quite rapidly, and has not returned to the position of marginal appreciation, but has a different doctrine of subsidiarity, namely, facts and evidence are best assessed by the national judge. And we will trust that assessment under there's a threshold of course, the contestation that deserves our attention. And I think that's a much more elegant, much more procedural rather than substantive uh, doctrine of subsidiarity, which could be applied also by the World Court of Human Rights. So something like the Human Rights Committee version of subsidiarity would work rather than a normative position of marginal appreciation, which on a global level would boil down to cultural diversity, which we don't what I mean, we who believe in the universality of human rights do what? Sarah? So just on the last point, I, I definitely agree with Martin's portrayal of the jurisprudence of the Human Rights Committee and the margin of appreciation. But in part, the reason that the Human Rights Committee takes the position that facts and evidence are best mm -hmm. uh, adjudicated by the national jurisdiction is that we have no fact-finding mm -hmm. capacity. And at least as I understand it, the World Court of Human Rights would in fact have yeah. the ability to receive evidence, yeah. hear from witnesses, conduct site visits. So it's not clear to me, I guess this is a question, it's not clear to me how that would be reconciled with some t type of subsidiarity relationship like that of the, the Human Rights Committee. Uh, with respect to the question of the role as norm generator, I, I, I definitely think that there is, um, a weight that is given to the pronouncement of a body that is called a court that is not given to a body that isn't called a court. Uh, but I think that the real question is, is the value added that you would get from this worth the cost of the creation of this institution, which ultimately I think is unlikely to have binding jurisdiction over states who aren't already a party to the jurisdiction of some binding adjudicatory court in a regional human rights system. Um, I think that the, a lot of norms are being generated right now in the regional systems, in the various mechanisms uh, and special procedures of the Human Rights Council, in the treaty bodies, and we do not have an effective system at all for publicizing those and making them accessible either to these institutions or to actors that would like to use them. And I, it seems to me that limited resources are much better placed to make those um, enunciations translated and accessible widely and freely than to create a World Court of Human Rights. Economic, social, and cultural rights, it's an excellent question. I think I would resist the suggestion that economic, social, and cultural rights and civil and political rights are not addressed together because I think in both the Human Rights Committee and the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights and the Inter-American Commission and Court, these in fact are addressed together and increasingly so, probably particularly in the Inter-American system. Um, I don't know how many states would actually accept the jurisdiction of a World Court of Human Rights to adjudicate economic, social, and cultural rights. 21 states have accepted the individual complaint mechanism under um, the, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Now, it's a new, 
it's a new individual complaint mechanism. I recognize that, but I think there is enough nervousness about the policy implications of adjudication of economic, social, and cultural rights, particularly when you're talking about the obligation of the state to fulfill the obligations, not simply to respect them, um, that I would be quite surprised if there were a widespread embrace of such a jurisdiction by a world court. Can I ask a question to both of you that amounts to the question, would the following be a win-win-win? <laughs> Namely, um, in starting your court, uh, Martin, um, the initial focus would be on counterterrorism cases against non-state actors. This is something you know well. Uh, why would this be a win-win-win? You could say things like military commissions, which are widely criticized, could transfer their cases to these kinds of courts. Uh, you could take cases like um, Paris, uh, San Bernardino, Brussels, Boko Haram to such a court. And it would address Sarah's concern because this is something where there would be a resource uh, motivation uh, to support some kind of adjudication for these people, but looking less vindictive than might happen at the na national level. So um, is this a proposal that might actually bridge these concerns? As you know, uh, Antonio Cassese thought that perhaps the uh, Sierra Le I'm sorry, the uh, Lebanon Tribunal could become a terrorism court, but uh, he passed away before uh, that came into being. But he was focused on one particular case, the Hariri case. So um, is it possible that such a uh, framing, uh, limiting the initial subject matter, uh, could uh, achieve what you want, get more resources into the system, and solve some problems for governments. And by the way, make it more attractive to uh, 30, more than the 30 smallest countries in the world, which is what, what you're proposing. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I, I can't have all those wins. In the sense that it, it wouldn't be a criminal court, and in that sense, terrorists wouldn't themselves be tried. What it could be attractive for is um, ethnic or religious groups or regional autonomy arrangements that make a claim for international legitimacy. Let's say Catalonia or Scotland. They might want to join, or an indigenous tribe in the United States might want to join. And they could then use the clout of international human rights in order to uh, say that we are a nation, we want to be judged at the international level by international judges rather than the national judges of this particular country who has colonized us. So there is a benefit, uh, but it doesn't extend as far as to, to cover terrorists themselves. It could, it could cover situations where one of these kind of groups which uh, seeks to exercise territorial jurisdictional control is accused of harboring terrorism. Then we could have a state responsibility kind of accountability for, for that kind of situation, but not, still not a criminal court. So say against Pakistan for Osama bin Laden? Pakistan is a state, so it should be possible already now, but yes. That's a good case? That's for, a good case. That's a, you like that case? Okay. Yeah. Sarah? Uh, so I agree with Martin that uh, the proposal, I think, wouldn't accomplish the goals of, mm. of the court that he is. You don't like it either. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think you would. It's all right. I mean, it, it sounds to me like you're talking about an amendment of the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court uh, mm. to extend to certain crimes of terrorism that are already not encompassed mm. by that court's jurisdiction. And obviously, that's something states could contemplate. But I think individual criminal responsibility is quite different from the type of uh, state responsibility we're talking about here. And then I think Martin has articulated um, yet another reason why states will oppose this idea, <laughs> which is if separatist movements mm -hmm. and secessionist movements see this as an opportunity to gain international legitimacy, um, well, I guess I can stop there. <laughs> can I answer Sandra Fredman's first question, which was to Sarah? Go ahead. Yeah, um, what was it? The indivisibility. The indivisibility. 
I, th I think we already have quite a lot of proof that it works. And uh, partly because the, the, the treaties are not watertight compartments. We have the famous area pronouncement by the European Court of Human Rights of there not being a watertight division. And the extension through basically fair trial rights and, and property rights of the European Court to cover social rights issues. And on the Human Rights Committee side, we have the notion of culture in Article 27, and we have the extensive non-discrimination jurisprudence by the Human Rights Committee in social welfare issues. So we are halfway there, uh, but I think the World Court would be better placed to take that further in the sense that principally it would be looking at the conduct of a state or entity across all human rights. So it would have a stronger normative basis to do the integration. And even when a state has accepted only part of the scope of rights, uh, there would be the clause saying, read in light of the totality of human rights law and general international law. So I think we would get two steps ahead in the integration. So I think we're uh, at the point at which our two speakers get to make their final submission. Um, so uh, Martin, you can close uh, with your final submission in favor of the proposition for two minutes. Sarah will then have two minutes. And then for those of you with, who are on the verge of, of leaving, please stay for these four minutes and then cast your vote uh, so that we have a, a resounding conclusion here. No, no hanging chads, as we say. OK. <laughs> Martin, go. Yeah, those who listened to me carefully at an early occasion heard me say that the reliance on the International Court of Justice is the third best model. <laughs> Currently, we have a situation where we have the uh, fragmented treaty bodies at the UN level. And in principle, there is an unused appeal possibility to the International Court of Justice in the sense that at any time, a state which is unhappy with the pronouncements of the Human Rights Committee could, in the General Assembly, when dealing with the annual report of the Human Rights Committee, say, let's ask an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice. So, we have there an inbuilt possibility for the International Court of Justice. So that's the current situation. That's the fourth best model. The third best model is developing the International Court of Justice as a human rights court. But I think it would require some mechanism for individual complaint. There can be filters. There can be selection. There can be selection by the court itself. But we would have to recognize that it has to be a human rights procedure. And it hence cannot be based only on as a contentious jurisdiction in interstate cases or the request for an advisory opinion by the General Assembly. The second best model is the merger of the two covenant bodies, the Human Rights Committee and the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which would only require amendment of the optional protocol to the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Covenant because the covenant itself doesn't define the treaty body. Those functions could be attributed to the Human Rights Committee, which could become a truly uh, universal in scope human rights treaty body by dealing with, the, with issues from both covenants, including complaints. And if we achieve the merger of the two covenant bodies, now it's the 50th anniversary of the covenants, uh, we could then think of overlapping membership with the more specialized committees. So a de facto amalgamation of the treaty body system so that we would have a major human rights committee for the two covenants and then satellite bodies with the overlapping membership. That would be the second best model. But still the best model is the World Court of Human Rights, which uh, is purely jurisdictional, based on voluntary ratification by the vanguard of 30 states uh, to get started. And as we have seen in existing human rights mechanisms, there's appeal uh, of being in the group of human rights compliant states or in the future corporations, international organizations. So we would expect gradually others to join in. And the advantage for evolution uh, of the law in starting with a fairly small group is that we would get a body selected by the states who want to be in the vanguard and also cases that represent the cutting edge. So it would get a kickstart 
and ultimately it would nevertheless be able to pull others on board. This is just a prediction which is based on the way human rights treaties and human rights uh, monitoring mechanisms have evolved over the past uh, 50 years with great success and to continue it the best way is the World Court of Human Rights. So that Sarah has equal time, you have three minutes and 30 seconds. Well, I think the good news is we all agree that uh, it would be a good thing to improve the overall functioning of the human rights system and in particular its ability to protect people on the ground and I think that's why we're here uh, and that's the reason for this conversation. Hmm. I still believe uh, that it's not the right time, in fact it's an extraordinarily bad time to try to put energy and effort into creating a cumbersome uh, institution that would be expensive, that would have powers that no existing human rights body has ever attempted to exercise, including over non-state actors, um, broad remedial powers, uh, collective jurisdiction over 21 different human rights conventions, um, and would require a multinational treaty um, in order to establish it. I think it's highly unlikely that this would achieve the goals that it seeks to accomplish. I think it's highly unlikely that states would join it in any meaningful way who are not already party to a binding regional human rights system. I think it's highly unlikely that it would end up providing meaningful access to human rights protection for a large number of victims who are not already able to access current mechanisms. And it seems to me that if the model for this proposal is the European Court of Human Rights, then we should ensure that the European Court of Human Rights and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights have at least as much in resources as the European Court of Justice. Why not start there? So again, I would reiterate that if your government asked you today how it should spend its dollars, I think that the answer must be to focus on strengthening the current system as we have it. Um, so, uh, could you describe the voting procedure, please? Can you describe the voting procedure? So, we're just going to ask everyone that is for the proposition to raise their hands and to just keep them up for the vote, and so we can have some justice voting, and then um, we'll go for it against the proposition. So, we're going to ask for the proposition first. So, all for the proposition, namely on the side of Martin Shinan's presentation. Am I voting? Please do. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> okay, and again. Close call, but Sarah is You're winning. not voting, Harold. <laughs> Uh, please keep your hands up. Um, electors, do you have a final count? Perfect. Would you like to? Yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> the envelope, please. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, DAPA was what you whispered to me on the way in that this is the question on the public international law paper. Is that something I wasn't supposed to reveal? <laughs> oh, never mind. Um, so the official tally uh, for the proposition, 17 against 33, the nays have it, uh, the opposition prevails. But, um, but it was only for today. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it doesn't include the Not online. At this <laughs> oh, yes. And there's online voting as well? No. <laughs> OK. Um, anyway, uh, 17 for 33 against, but I think it was a, a rich and um, a very informative conversation on a topic that uh, many of us had not given uh, full attention until today. So let's have a big round of applause. For folks.
can I then just bring the proceedings to a close by thanking our wonderful panel, uh, our moderator and our two speakers who've, who've really um, crystallized the, this very difficult issue. As they said, as Martin said at the end, it's not, I'm sure it's a question we will keep talking about. Um, I think it's also a, a fitting, um, one of the fitting conclusory, conclusory events of our Human Rights for Future Generations program, which is coming to an end. Um, our program was aiming to ask these very difficult questions about institutions for protecting human rights for future generations. And this is, of course, one of the key questions around that, which would include all of our different dimensions, poverty, environment, and armed conflict. Um, I, I just want to conclude by thanking our, our wonderful audience as well for coming along and for, for your excellent questions and interventions. And also, most uh, particularly to the organizers, um, Jakob Kuosmanen, Helen McDermott, Dapo, and Zoe. Where is Zoe? Um, thank you so much for organizing it so well. And finally, many thanks to the Martin School, not just for hosting us, but for funding our, our program, which has been extremely challenging, extremely rewarding, extremely fruitful. So thank you very much.